Hello, everybody. I'm going to begin, if, if I may. Um, welcome to this session. Hope you enjoyed the last one. My, mine is, my name is Sebastian uh, Bailey. I am the co-founder and president of, of MindGym. And we're here to answer this question, what does it take to change culture and is it worth it? And I feel very, very uh, privileged to have James Bardrick and Jenny Gray, both from, from City, join us today to tell us the, the story of the uh, cultural transformation that City has embarked on, a three-year journey uh, of which they are 18 months through at the moment. And it, yeah, it's, just, it's a real treat to have come and actually give us the, the inside story of that transformation. So I wanted to start with these three questions. Why this? Why now? And, and why us? So why this particular um, topic? Well, the... To, to be able to get an insight of one of the largest organizations in the world engaged in cultural transformation and using a behavioral science approach to make those sorts of changes, we thought was an opportunity too good to pass up in terms of sharing um, that particular story. Why now? Well, I don't need to tell you about the, vo the amount of volatility in the markets over the last uh, 18, 24 months. Enormous amounts of change where we've had to look at changing business models, changing operating models. And of course, that leads to us thinking more deeply about what our strategy is and how do we employ, deploy that. And of course, we then have to execute on that strategy. Our execution is only going to be as good as the culture in which it is operating. So in many respects, our ability to drive the, the changes that we want to see strategically are entirely dependent on the culture that we have to be able to deploy it. And in a period of significant change, it's important to be thinking about that culture now. And then why us? Well, many of us are either embarking on a culture change journey, in the middle of a culture change journey, or considering to engage in one. And so for all of us in this room, I'm sure it's super relevant to you, which is why we chose this particular um, topic. Sound good? Yes, excellent. So we we're going to talk probably for about 35 minutes or so, and then I have a 10-minute Q&A at the end. So do please uh, work through your, or think through your questions, and we'll get them at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'm going to hand over to, to James. Okay. Well, thank you very much, all of you, uh, for coming along and listening uh, to us. Um, uh, you know, uh, th this is a something which, as mentioned, we're, we're, we're not even halfway through, so uh, work in progress, but uh, very keen to share, share with you. Now, some of you will know who City is, some of you uh, won't so much, um, so I'm just going to take a tiny little bit of time just to set the context by, you know, what is City, um, what do we do, why do we do it, and, and then I'll hand over to Jenny to talk about the changes to the how we do that uh, that, that are underfoot. Now, we are one of the largest uh, banks in the world, but one of the things I want everybody to understand is that we think there are some big differences about us. We're not just another bank. Um, we have a global footprint, uh, which is very different uh, to, to, to many uh, others. That is very valuable to our clients and to, to, to us and gives us great relationships and insights from all around the world at a time when having that insight and world changes is, is so important. We serve clients in 160 countries, our people operate and do that from 95 different locations. That's a very significantly larger number than any, any of our peers. And that makes us different. What, what, are, we, what are we about? Well, look, our, 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 our strategy really is to be the preeminent uh, banking partner for institutions uh, with cross-border needs. Uh, we want to be a global leader in wealth management and... Uh, we, uh, we want to be a valued personal bank in, in the US, the, uh, the, the company's home market. Um, and we do what banks do. We do foreign exchange, we do payments, we look after people's stuff, uh, custody. Uh, we um, join investors with users of capital um, uh, around the world. The reason that we do that distinctively differently is we are very much focused on doing that for clients across borders on a very, very regular basis. Uh, almost continuous basis. So, 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 so that's really at the heart of who we are. And our clients, well, they're, they're corporates. I mean, um, Emma, GSK is one of our clients. Many of your companies are clients of City, and you will probably know that it's partly to do with our globality and, and our capabilities and our people uh, that have that expertise and those, uh, that, 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 that knowledge um, that, uh, that means that you're our clients. But it's financial institutions, investors, asset managers, um, other banks, insurance companies, um, a great, uh, great range. But also governments um, uh, look to us as well. 
And more fundamentally, what do we all come into work thinking that we're there to do? Uh, what is our mission? Um, Emma talked about um, uh, you know, her people's uh, team uh, really being passionate about patients and, um, and improving health. And our mission is enabling progress and economic growth, not only for our clients, but also for the communities uh, that we operate in. Now, um, I, I'm going to give you some information about scale just because it's not to show off, it's not to sort of beat chest in a bankery type way. Uh, I, I, I'm really not into that kind of thing. Um, but I'm going to give you some idea about scale because I've already indicated the geographical spread. Um, but there's also a scale thing, and that is really relevant and will be to some of you as well around how you do this culture change and how you make it really happen. So we move about $4 trillion uh, of, of our clients' money a day around the world. Um, that's about the size of the German um, economy, uh, just to sort of scale it. It's, this is big at scale, uh, complicated activity. Um, but we're also big in people. We've got 240,000 colleagues. Um, and we're big in clients. We've got 13,000 uh, institutional and corporate clients and, and many millions more uh, in terms of uh, citizens who use uh, cards and uh, bank accounts and the like. We've been around a long time, 200 years, but really over the last 100 years, we've had that dif differentiation of being very international. We set up in the UK in 1902. Okay, so what? Um, more interesting, we set up in China that same year which set up in dozens and dozens of countries around the world in the first half of the 20th century. So, so that, that's really to the heart of the model. Closer to home, 11,000 people in London. Here's the one I find really interesting. 116 different nationalities in our London-based staff. That gives us a diversity of background, experience, capabilities. 4,000 people in Belfast in Northern Ireland. Even more interesting, 40 different nationalities in our Belfast operations. So that's really to the heart, that diversity and different, uh, different backgrounds. And the value of all of that to our clients, I think, is very powerful. Um, and they tell us it is. And most of them really like that as an idea. Some of them want us to perform a little bit better in certain aspects, and we want to perform a little bit better, and that's where we're going. And so it's also the reason why, after 36 years, I'm still there. I love it. It's an absolutely fantastic organisation. It's, yes, it's got the, the muscles and the brawn to do things which are really important. It's got the brain and the knowledge and the insights and the experience which are important. But it's also got a heart and a soul which really, really matters and makes it a really, really great place to work. So can we be better? Must we be better? Must we change? Yes, we have to. And we own that responsibility to make that happen. Cue Jenny. How thank you, James. Thank you. And I'm going to start by saying thank you for coming to this session because I was looking at all the other sessions and wished I was there, actually. <laughs> and you're here, so we hope you, hopefully it will be worth your while. Um, as you can hear, James says, we didn't think our culture was broken. We're actually really proud of our culture. But we have a new CEO last year, or the year before last, uh, Jane Fraser. Yay, first female, um, first female Wall Street CEO, British woman, and new strategy for City. And... As the, as the uh, saying goes, um, if you want, uh, as the saying goes, if you don't change your, your culture to meet your strategy, the strategy will be eaten itself for breakfast by culture. So we needed to make some shifts in line with the strategic changes she wanted to make. And in particular, as part of that, we wanted to empower our people to be faster, more nimble, to take the right actions to meet the needs of our clients. And as you heard Octavia say when he talked about this session, Culture can be a bit like jelly, really amorphous, potentially. Um, everything and nothing, owned by everyone and no one. So how do you put some structure and have a strategy around that? So we started by putting in place a model. It wasn't, we didn't exactly make it up, we customised it a bit, about how we thought about culture. So at the top of the model, you can see... You know, we want to articulate what is the culture that you want to drive towards that is going to meet your strategy. But ultimately, culture is a combination of what you believe, you can see that in the middle, and how we behave. And that is evidenced through behaviours and norms, leadership, who and how and what we reward, and the decisions and choices we want to make. So these things at the bottom are sort of drivers of culture, of course. Tone for the top, you hear about a lot when you, want to, when you hear about culture change. 
Um, but there are also levers you can pull in any combination you want to, if you want to make adjustments and tweaks to your culture. If you're an anthropologist, you would call some of these things um, rituals, rituals that any organisation has that really are not only an exemplification of your culture, but they also reinforce it as well. So in the programme that I lead, which is, you know, as I said, the longest job title in the world, Accountability to Culture and Talent, Transformation, um, we focused on, we, we, we identified a number of, of elements within that model that we wanted to, 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 pick, to pick to actually um, work on to change our culture. So we included elements like governance structures and who is in, who's in what committees and who gets to make what decisions. Um, performance management, talent management. Talent management is really important. If you think about anyone that's ever worked in a bank, and I know there's some here, um, how you get promoted to that sort of you know, real leadership layer of managing director is one of those rites of passage that really is an important part of organisational cultures in banks. And so what we did last year is we made, we made changes to that, that process. We made it more consistent across all business lines. We made it more objective in terms of what the data was feeding in. And we made it more transparent because a transparent process is, is usually and pretty much always makes it um, better for people who are, don't perceive themselves to be in, in groups, etc. And as a result of that, we had the most diverse class of MDs last year than, than we've ever had. But we're not here to talk about that. I just wanted to get that overall context. We're actually here to talk about Cities New Way, which sits in the Our Behaviour and Norms bucket, um, Ways of Working, and, and the three-year global programme that we put in place based on behavioural science to underpin all of this change and transformation and enter Mind Gym. Um, so the first thing we did, we did a lot of research to think about um, how we were going to actually focus our work. We and what the key themes were that we wanted to, to, to focus on. So we looked at, obviously, a lot of data from employees, um, voice of employee surveys and other surveys, our client surveys, um, and we looked at external research too, um, in, in terms of best behavioural um, best practice. Um, and then we talked about all of this with, critically with, this, with Jane, and the CEO and her leadership team, and also actually the board, who are really heavily interested in this too. And these are the themes that we, we came up with. The first was ownership. We want to empower our people to address issues quickly by helping them see the bigger picture and their personal contribution towards it. Secondly, productive debates and decision-making. We want quicker decisions. We want them, those decisions to be informed by the right information and also critically diverse perspectives. And then collaboration. We want to see more collaboration across teams. And not shown here, we also understood that there was these underlying conditions that we had to get right. And we, we articulated those two, and they were purpose, we'll come on to that, psychological safety, and the inclusion again of diverse perspectives. And I think at the outset, it was quite hard, if you can imagine, to get everyone to commit to a three-year programme even before you'd started and even before you knew how it was going to work. But we were very clear that you don't see culture change happen in a year or in a few months. This is something you need to show sustained long-term commitment to. And then the other thing we did, which was oh, kind of difficult to land, was we said we're going to do one thing a year, one thing at a time. And that was really difficult because I sort of, I love this, I love that film, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. We do not have a multiverse. We have to focus. We can't move in and out. And so we decided that we, that we would do that. And I'll talk about how that worked as well. I think perhaps also important to mention is that this sits alongside, obviously, all kinds of other initiatives around diversity, inclusion, all the work we're doing on hybrid working, well-being. That's all part of the broader cultural narrative, but these are the things we wanted to identify and these are the areas where we needed to make shifts. So, Sebastian, how did we design it? Thank you. Yeah, so what we thought we would do is just speak to some of the design principles that we worked as well. And actually, the, this, this three-year decision was a really, really critical uh, decision point and a really important one about working through how things get embedded to the organisation. So what were the other design principles that, that, that we worked through? The first one is that it really needed to be behaviourally oriented. What we didn't want to speak to was just mindsets or attitudes here. We wanted to get very specific about actionable behaviours. Um, why? Well, because if we think about culture, fundamentally, culture is the sum of all of our behaviours. If we think about how we behave, uh, there are some estimates that we spend as much as 45% of our time behaving unconsciously. So we're not even conscious of what we're doing 
Uh, it's a routinized unconscious behavior, which is otherwise known as a habit. So as much as 45% of our time is engaged with habits. So to really look to change behavior and to really look to change culture, we need to start to think about changing the habits of the organization. The other thing we recognized was to get to 240,000 people, there is a very significant scale challenge here. And supporting leaders change their behaviors and visibly change their behaviors provides a very strong cue for others to go on and then change their behavior. So there was a critical leadership component to this. So that was the first behavioral component. The second one was social. So we recognize that we take often many of our behavioral cues from authority, but we trust the people who most trust the people who are just like us. We're more likely to believe people who are like us and similar positions to us. And so we recognize the importance of creating a social movement that was as much bottom up as it was um, top down and engaging a group of individuals who would help prototype, test, experiment with and provide feedback on the habits that we were looking to, to change. And if there was one thing, and I know Jen, Jenny's going to talk about this in more detail, but I'm super excited about the social component and the change makers who I think have really driven a difference um, in the organization. We then have this idea of keeping it really, really simple. Almost so simple that people wonder what the fuss is about. You know, that the simpler, the better. The idea being is that you can understand it really fast, you can execute it really fast, um, and you can recognize whether or not it's happened really fast. So the simplicity is key. And you might say, well, you know, surely you need something more complex to make more of a, a significant change. But actually, just with marginal gains, if you've got some simple ideas well executed, you can start to talk about one, two, three, four percent change in productivity and performance. And over 240,000 people, that starts to make a very measurable uh, difference. Next one was, was uh, the idea of it being integrated. This couldn't be some abstract, academic, um, distant set of ideas. It had to be absolutely embedded into the everyday practice of everyday work moment to moment. So it was very important, this idea of having the habits and the behaviours integrated and visible and, of course, finally, um, tangible. We didn't want this to work privately somewhere else in someone's mind. We wanted to see it out loud because fundamentally adoption of these habits is the, the, the lead indicator of whether or not change is taking place and therefore it has to be tangible, it has to be visible, it has to be out loud, it has to be in front of people. So tell us a little bit more about how uh, that worked. I'm going to hand to Jenny. Thank you. Um, so this is narrative often about culture change, but it's all about tone from the top, and it starts with tone from the top. And in fact, leaders get it, don't they? They, they, they know what the culture is, and they've got their culture right. And then the problem is, is the frozen middle. Um, they're the problem. Um, I don't buy that, by the way. What we wanted to do was have a groundswell of change. Um, from the bottom of the organisation across the organisation. And so the idea behind the change makers as Seb Sebastian, is that you Seb or Sebastian in Seb, this Seb context? Seb is good, Jenny, Seb is Seb, Seb, good. Um, I should have asked that before. Um, so the idea behind the change makers is, is, as Seb said, if we're more likely to do something new, if we see our friends or our colleagues doing it. And, but it was more than that. We, we wanted the change makers to be more than early adopters. We wanted them to be co-creators. We wanted them to help us design the habits and tell us what will actually work in real life in their context. And that leads to another um, benefit, which is what behavioral scientists call the IKEA effect, which is that you have a greater investment in something that you've directly changed. Those behavioral scientists have never s witnessed a piece of furniture made by me from <laughs> IKEA. <laughs> um, so this was very much a volunteer initiative. Um, we didn't really, we, we went out, we didn't actually say in retrospect very much about what this role entailed. There was no particular status coming from it. They weren't getting any monetary reward. Um, and we didn't really, you know, there was no sort of kind of status, as I say, uh, uh, linked to it. So we had no idea really how many people would put their hands up. Literally, we had no idea. We agreed that if we had 500 in an organisation our size, at least, and as long as it had geographical spread and we had spread of levels and it spread across all of our businesses, that would be a good number of people that would help us do that co-creation and ensure that the habits were really going to work and land. When, we, when the invitations went out, we were literally bowled over because very, very quickly we had 2,700 2, people um, volunteer 
to be change makers. We actually had more than that. We just almost couldn't onboard them all into the, into the process. And now we've got 5,000 people who are really very visible role models. That they literally represent equally represent all parts of our business, the investment banking business, our consumer banking business, um, technology, functions, all parts of the, all levels, all parts of the world. And in those, um, you have these dark days of self-doubt when you start some of these programs and it's a bit sort of out there and not quite what we've done before. And in those days, I would look at the Excel spreadsheet, which had literally 5,000 names and all of the reasons they gave why they wanted to be change makers. And that would, these were 5,000 people that really loved the organization. They could see what needed to change and they wanted to be part of that change. And so that would inspire me every day. So I think maybe with that, we can put that sort of tired sort of leadership trope of the frozen middle to bed. What, we, what you need to do is have a wealth of thought through strategy that can be communicated and that people can understand and be part of. So, as I mentioned earlier, we started by focusing on ownership. And why we did that was that because we're a, we're a huge organisation, as James said. And in any large organisation, and particularly one that's changing fast in a transformation as, as we have been, the risk is that people lose sight of their role and how it connects that overall purpose. Everyone knows that overall purpose of um, enabling economic progress. But do they, do they remember how that role that they do connects to that purpose. And people are in highly specialised role, and they're quite distant sometimes, they feel, from those process. And there's a lot of noise in the system, so it's really easy um, to find it hard to prioritise, to understand what's important, what's urgent, where, are, where, am I, where am I accountable, and where could I use my time most productively. And so one manifestation of that is this meeting, and uh, this cartoon meeting where people are sitting around the table and they're kind of, they're not even sure, they're asking, <laughs> scratching their heads, asking each other why they're there and what they're, there, what they're meeting about. So we started with why. We're all hearing from Simon Sinek later, so I don't need to explain to you the power of why. And literally, the first habit was as simple as this, which is that we asked people at the beginning of a meeting or, or a new project or, or whatever seemed relevant, three questions, why this? Let's establish clarity of purpose over what we're doing. Why now? Let's create a sense of urgency and, and understand the time frame. And why us? Let's understand and establish each of our individual roles. I think it was really, you know, people think that they do this. They just don't enough. They don't habitually do it. And they think, well, why do I need these three words to do it? The important thing was having a shared language about it so that people see everyone doing it in the same way. And then, and then the next habit was as simple as, at the end of that meeting or project, you would actually just say who owns what, and you would establish who is accountable to move it forward. So that you don't drift out of a meeting thinking, that, thinking you knew what was going to happen next, but actually no one knew who was actually going to drive something forward. And so the core vehicle that we used... Um, sorry, I've got a really dry mouth. I'm going to do that now. We started by introducing these habits through... I mean, you don't need a lot of training, let's be clear, in these habits, but we did find that we, we introduced them with um, 125 workshops um, with, that, that reached 21,000 people that actually volunteered to come to these workshops. They weren't like these mandatory trainings that banks do a lot. These were literally just marketed and we asked people to come. And I think there was a bit of a word of mouth because as soon as they realised they were different and new and actually quite fun, people wanted to come. But even if they didn't come, um, you can use these habits because you can see other people using them. And also we followed all this up with a really sort of um, high profile communications. But the, attend the attendees of the workshops, um, following the workshops, received follow up communications. And those were to nudge people into actually using the habits by offering practical suggestions of, of when and how to incorporate them. And we did other things like we integrated the, the, the questions into the beginning of PowerPoint decks that we used to introduce meetings or new projects. Um, we got leaders to use them at the beginning of town halls. Um, one thing that really worked was that we created a Zoom Outlook plugin so that when you sent a meeting invite, in, it asked you to populate why this, why us, why now into the meeting invitation. Um, and... Uh, 
that would help you as a receiver to establish whether that's a meeting you definitely need to be in or could you be somewhere else. We even, um, intru- we even wrote a template email that you could write back to the meeting organiser saying, you haven't, write- you haven't answered those questions, so therefore I will not be turning up to the meeting. Um, and it was one of those things that people I don't think use so much, but actually it was just the fact of doing it was an empowerment that people could take control of how they use their time. It's a um, useful point because I noticed a number of people chuckling then. Actually, having humour and positivity as part of this, really important, really has helped people refocus. Yeah, and I think it sort of helps ground it. It makes it not so worthy as these culture change things can be. Um, the other things we did, we had stickers. Go, once we came back to the office, you walked into a meeting room on the outside. It said, why this, why us, why now? And as you left, it said, who owns what? Not a revolutionary idea. You go into a bathroom, sorry, and you will see, please remember to wash your hands as you leave. So there's no new ideas under this sun, but it's how do you kind of repurpose some of them for your, for your, for your um, objectives. And I think one of the, um, as, as James said, it's not rocket science. And, you know, you can have people say, look, we've got these big strategic challenges, and your answer is to ask us to ask the question why. It sort of feels like, it feels like you needed something bigger and grander. But as, as Seb talked about, I think what won the day was this power of this shared language, this emerging realisation of that if everyone everywhere is doing this all at once, that you have those incremental improvements that come from that. And you hear stories would start circulating of people, for example, reviewing their diary um, for the next week and just choosing to take a whole load of meetings out because they just ask themselves those questions. Um, so that whole, it, that whole thing about the allocation of time and where you put your energy and empowering people to think about that was one of those benefits that came out of this that we hadn't necessarily thought about, but we heard Emma Wormsley talk about the importance of that earlier. So, um, James, I think you're going to give us some harder facts about how we... Sure, I, I absolutely am. And, but um, just before I do, and I promise I'm not going to reawaken the frozen middle... But I do just want to put a perspective. I mentioned earlier that I've been with the firm for 36 years. I explain why the the very solid root parts, uh, to use uh, Emma's language around culture, meant so much to me. But actually, all of us used to get frustrated at wanting to be better, wanting to be better performance, faster, nimbler, um, uh, and in serving our clients. And I think it never rang true to me that uh, actually we had very, very um, good Um, and um, full of potential juniors. Then we had this sort of frozen middle and then we had sort of inspired leaders. Well, I've been all of it. You know, I think it's all of us. And I've I've been every single bit of it from, you know, day one through to 36 years later. I didn't recognise that. I really didn't. The second thing I want to jog back to is the change makers. The change makers didn't surprise me, but I was so pleased to see it happen. When you see all those people, not just in the middle, up at the top, down at the, uh, the lower and more recent joiners uh, as well, actually saying, we want to we be part of this, we want to do this, and actually, great that it surprised a lot of people, didn't surprise me. I knew that that was in there, and, it, and we released it, so fantastic. Right, on to what I was meant to talk about. <laughs> Measurements, absolutely critical. We've talked about the need for performance, we've need, <clears throat> talked about the need to make sure that we are getting what we want to get. And so measurement was uh, extremely performance uh, important, and because of that, a comprehensive measurement strategy was designed into the programme to ensure that it's the City New Way programme was going to, um, uh, the impact of it was going to be uh, both aligned to the initial uh, behavioural uh, research and the validation of the issues that we'd come up with, but actually that we could track it and we could, we could course correct and we could, we could really manage it. And as we thought about the right metrics, um, habit adoption seemed a very important one. Um, in fact, uh, uh, important ones. And, um, you know, it not only improves the visibility, it, it allows you to track and monitor, uh, but it also, its mere existence reinforces the habit adoption. You keep talking about the same simple things. It, it's, it really works. Two surveys um, to, to get those. One, um, a, a, a pulse survey every quarter, 25% of our, our people uh, surveyed and asked what, uh, what they're seeing, what they're thinking about it, uh, what, what's changing uh, around them. And also the people who volunteered for the workshops that Jenny described 30 days after they've been there. How are you feeling about that? Have you changed? Are you seeing others change? Is it working? Are the issues that you're dealing with better for it and getting that data? And look, these surveys will build over time. Um, and not only will they 
uh, become bigger and more granular, um, but they're already providing fantastic data. But over time, they, they, they start giving you themes and direction uh, uh, as well. And so, look, halfway through the actual launch of the program, early days, because these are in some ways lagging indicators in terms of the uh, progress, but it's really working. It really is working. Look at the, look at the, the results. I am a mechan mechanical engineer by background. I did five years of that before I became uh, involved in finance. Um, and um, I, I, I'm always asking for the, uh, the validation and the numbers and do they add up. Um, well, 60% of our colleagues, okay, coming out of this, uh, these surveys, were seeing the ownership habit in action, in regular action. I've been told by some really smart academic people that if we got to 20%, we'd, we'd get close to a tipping point where that would start to become an institutional habit rather than just personal habits. And we're at 60. It's fantastic. And that is surprising. That really, I, 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 I and others were, were very positively surprised. So we're on to something here. But let's also look at uh, calibrating the data from things we were doing already. We've, for the longest time, done a voice of the employee annual survey. I'm sure many of you will have similar things in your organization. And from that, we got the fact that 83% of our colleagues uh, said that they were satisfied with their involvement in decisions that affected their work. Now, the absolute number is high. I love that. But the real big one for me and I've looked at these surveys for years, for decades in my case, um, and we've got really worried about plus or minus one per base percentage point downs and really excited about plus or minus you know, one percent base, uh, percentage point increases, and we got up 10% since the previous year. It really, really moved the needle. We've got to see if that's sustainable and, and, and how it carries, but that, that was a big, big impact. So I think it's, it, it's working. It's, it's, it's there. We now have to maintain and sustain. 88% um, of our colleagues think that their team take ownership around them. And so these are great numbers. I think the little caveat here is that these are sentiments. They're not actual results and they're not actual outcomes yet. And that's where I get to the really interesting part. We talked earlier about the integrated approach. Seb talked about this having to be integrated. We'd have stuff around culture, stuff around initiatives that we were doing, and good or not so good results coming from that. We'd then have the business metrics, we'd have some of the financial metrics, um, and what was the connection? Well, we're now mapping this data to the business metrics and the financial metrics it's too early for me to say anything about that at the moment, but that's in place so that you bring it together. One thing I do already see is the different way, particularly our business leadership, now is looking at these things converge and becoming one rather than I've got the HR stuff, the culture stuff over here, I've got my business stuff over here, and from finance point of view, I've got my finance stuff over there. It's coming together in, in, in performance outcome. Uh, type uh, information, and, and that really reinforces the, uh, the, 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 the adoption and the habits. So look, a lot more work to do, um, uh, particularly around that, seeing that data come through, seeing that further convergence coming through. Uh, but it's, you know, after 18 months, I'm very, very excited about it, um, and I think it's looking pretty positive. So uh, what do I think overall? This is a long journey, but huge strides already. Jenny. So I'm going to bring us home for four questions. So as you said, we were, um, uh, this is a three-year program. We're actually in the middle of it in the second year. And you, you might have remembered me say that the second year we wanted to um, focus on productive debate. But we didn't want to lose the momentum that we've just talked about in year one. And so, you, so the way we thought about it was the following. You've probably heard of the concept of habit stacking, if you've read uh, Atomic Habits, for example. And which is really about building one routine on the momentum of another. So I've, I'm always getting injured, I'm always going to the physio, and the physio is always having a go at me because I never actually do the exercises that I've been told I should do. But the thing that changed that was that she said to me, Jenny, every morning um, when you brush your teeth, just do this one stretch. And, uh, and actually it did work. I did, I did, because I do usually remember to brush my teeth, always remember to brush my teeth. And so I managed to kind of get that in. And so this was, this was, the, this was the concept that we wanted to apply. And so I, we wanted to build this habit that was about leading to better and faster decisions. And the context for that was, in particular, is that we actually grew quite quickly over the last few years. Um, we started, um, I think, around in 
2020, maybe around then, about 200,000, and we're already we're at 240,000 now. And many of those people actually were joined and were onboarded in the in the pandemic, so they were onboarded re remotely. So in that context, you're obviously at heightened risk of teams that haven't built the trust and the psychological safety that you need to get all of those issues and diverse perspectives on the table so that they can be integrated and heard. And we also wanted a debate that not only got it on the table, but actually then moved forward to an actual decision or a solution. And you didn't end up in that endless cycle of um, going round and round in circles because you're not kind of really sure who owns the decision. So we work with Mindjim on a series of um, hackathons, they call them. They're really great. Um, and it was a way of actually generating ideas of what might be the habits, the interventions that could, break, that could help in this case. And we would develop some ideas and then test them. I think there was about 12 ideas that were tested. We had 800 colleagues actually volunteered, mostly change makers, to participate. Again, it's really showing the interest and passion that people had in, in this work. And, and the debate and the habits that we came up with are as following. So just imagine you start, you're starting a meeting. Why this? Why now? Why us? And then you've got a new topic. Um, and you want to signal that topic is a decision. You want to signal that it's open for debate. And the reason you want to do that is that you don't want people wasting their time on things that, quite frankly, there is no decision point. You've made the decision. You don't want to relitigate the decision. And then we want to make sure that we get all the ideas in. And we want those ideas not to be ideas that are constantly you know, negative, challenging, trashing. Um, so we want to introduce the language of build. So when you, when you, sit, you put in your idea, because you, I've got to build on that, it automatically gets you to think about moving this forward, creating something, not getting into this idea that uh, challenge and, and debate has to be negative and confrontational. But then we, then we are working in a bank, we're in the business of risk management, so it's everyone's responsibility to understand risk and to flag risks and issues. And so flag is when that is happening. And in fact, a red flag when you have a, a deal breaker, so you can quickly get that to the table as well. So we're actually, we've, just, we've only just introduced these habits, so I've got no data at all really to tell you how these are working, um, except for we're seeing them being used. James was just telling well, me about it. Uh, yeah. You know, that being used in an operating... I, I, I mean, it, this is anecdotal because it's new and we haven't got it yet. Um, here's one little bit of anecdotal evidence in some of our most senior governance meetings where some of the thorniest issues are, um, are, 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 are dis uh, raised, discussed, decisions are required. And then we have to take minutes of those and those minutes go often to boards. Uh, they can even go to regulators. One of the interesting things for me is that the people taking the minutes say they're getting much clearer discussion, they understand what the topic is, what the, deba the issues are, you know, how those develop and the build, what the flags that are raised are, the evidence of the challenge, etc. And it's, it's anecdotal, it's early days, but they feel they are already better meetings. We actually made the workshops only 45 minutes this time. As I said, this is not rocket science. You don't actually need the workshops. All. The workshops are really important, I have to say, because it sort of helps create the momentum. Um, but you can actually learn them from watching other people using them and from the communications, as I said. But what's interesting, we made the, what's interesting is that we made the workshops uh, 45 minutes this time. We, um, again, we didn't make them mandatory. And the, the increase of people are now turning up voluntarily to these workshops, even over last year, because they know that these workshops are short and they're fun and uh, they actually are practical. So we're even seeing this sort of just a, that sort of indicator of people attending the workshops. So I said, this, this is kind of risky bringing this to you here today. We're halfway through. We're halfway through. We cannot declare victory on really anything. Um, but I hope actually just by sharing the ideas gives you some ideas many of you work for our clients. Um, and even if you don't, I think it's, all in, it's in all our interest to have kind of thriving companies with great cultures. So I hope you've learned from something and we will take questions, Seb. Wonderful. Thank you, James. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> have a microphone. Um, we've got some five, eight minutes for, for questions. Yes, if you could, if, I think there is a microphone. We talked too much, didn't we? I'm sorry. Yeah. Do we have a, a microphone? Can we, Gillian, maybe you could help me with the microphone. Would that be okay? Thank you. So if you could say, sir, just gentleman at the back over there, if you could stand up and just say who you are and where you're from, that would be fantastic. Thank you. So Eros, uh, Eros Sharma, from, formerly from Generali, Head of Leadership and Learning for one of the business units. Were you able to identify any people 
in these teams that already did this well? And could you have used them as role models within that social maybe aspect of the process? Did you consider this way of changing yeah, culture uh, as well? Yeah, and I think that was you know, really where the change makers came in because you know, by nature, the fact they've self-selected to do it, they're interested in this. And then, of course, these were the early adopters and we profiled those on you know, internal social media and they, you know, we talk about them and show how we're using it. It was a really important part of the... So were they, were they volunteers or were they selected because you already d detected or knew that they would behave in this desired way? Well, the change makers were volunteers initially, we were volunteers. but we obviously got to know people and you know, could choose who we would profile because we could see them doing a really good job. And it was also good to have... Sometimes surprising people do this as well. People that perhaps not, you know, the people that really people look up to, but they may not think would be someone that would put their name forward for these kinds of initiatives. Thank you. Yes. So just in the second, Sophie, if you could do the second row. There we are. There's a microphone behind you. Fantastic discussion. I'm Carl Ghiwala from Veritas Technologies. I'm just curious more on the discovery and kind of the decision on what habits to propagate across 240,000 colleagues. At what level of those org at the organization was that made? Was that wisdom of the crowd or was that a small group of people kind of arriving at those uh, habits? It, it was a combination in the sense of there was a leadership decision that ownership was a theme. So then you start digging into the theme. What are the blockers that are getting in the way of ownership, both at City but just like in the research out there? And then you sort of start whittling down into, you know, what are the kind of behaviors that might, be easier to adopt, but then it became about testing them at scale. And so it wasn't really so Jane saying, everyone's going to say, why this, why this, why now? We went from that to a recommendation, which they you know, obviously agreed was going to work at City. Um, yes, can we go over here, please? Uh, Louise Benford, the AA. Um, to what extent, I don't know about City, but we're grappling with hybrid working and how we balance you know, people's lives with work and how much office time, like a lot of organisations. And to what extent did your approach to hybrid working, and I don't know what your approach is, did it help or hinder the cultural change journey? Well, our, our approach to hybrid working globally, and uh, Jane um, uh, launched this very, very early on and we stay consistent to it, is that uh, fundamentally we believe that most of our people are better together most of the time for a variety of well rehearsed reasons. However, we also have learnt and can benefit, um, as can our uh, people, from flexibility. So we say at least three days um, a week in the office for the vast majority uh, of people. Jenny? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's exactly right. I think we were one of the first to actually kind of say that three days a week is a, is a good model. I mean, that whole pandemic really exploded that myth, didn't it, that we all had to be in the office all the time or that certain jobs could only be done in the office all the time. And I think it's been a great thing for diversity and all kinds of other things. Um, uh, but, but it is important to, to come to the office as well. And so it's getting that balance, balance right. So I think another element of that was, well, how, how does this approach fit with a hybrid uh, working mm. model? I've got to tell you that if you have better structured, clearer meetings and discussions uh, in the way that we've described, they work better round a table, they work better on Zoom, they work better on a mix of round the table and on Zoom. And by the way, at City, with 95 different locations, in fact, probably more like 450 different locations in 95 countries, we've always been well used to having people operating um, uh, sort of uh, remotely rather than everyone being in the room. I think so the other day, the other thing that, sorry, was is that perhaps a few years ago when we launched something like this, we might have thought that we would have to do this a lot of face-to-face -face stuff. And that would have been off-putting and we would have think, oh, we can't afford it and so therefore we can't do it at scale. And because, because Zoom had become so ubiquitous, that sort of took that away. And so that really, I think, has been actually part of this ability to scale it, is that we could do these hackathons with 800 people, which we, I don't know that we would have thought of doing it in that way before. The, the, I think the pandemic. virtual component helped and actually mm. all the research on hybrid working is that um, accountability and ownership are one of the things that gets hit hardest, which means you end up with more people, which makes everything much less efficient. And I think actually the timing of, of mm. ownership in particular at this moment was, was very important. Yeah. Yes, just you had a question. Did you? Yes. Yes. Can we go over? Uh, uh, um, I'm Kate Salyuflot from Kingfisher. Um, can I just understand, I'm really curious about how you've talked to the organisation about the culture change. Have mm. you actually told, does it feel like a programme or have you done it in more stealth mode? 
it, it, I wouldn't call it stealth. It's pretty pretty visible. Um, and Jenny can talk mm. about there's many, many themes about it, but uh, uh, whether it's on screens, uh, on banners, on walls, um, via, via your screens and technology, it's everywhere. Uh, but Jenny? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's th these habits are linked to the broader culture program that re that I referred to, and I think it's. But you don't actually have to talk about them that much. You just do them, and then that's what we've really asked the leaders to do: not talk all the time about, just actually do them, and then also talk about your broader strategic change. And I think that's been impor important. If there is such a thing as a non-program program, program. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I think this is pretty pretty close to that because of that groundswell of of individual change that's highly observable, and then we start to take cues from from others. I think I've got time for one last. I know the lady at the front over here. If we could come over here, please, Sophie. Hi, I'm Anu Sarkar, Global Head of Leadership at Deutsche Bank. Uh, we are on a similar journey, but behind mm. you, so really, really mm. inspiring discussion. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the integration aspect of this journey with your investment decisions, the way you make decisions at, deep, um, at, at City? And you said a little bit about how you're trying to bring culture, financial decisions together. I'm just curious that how are you doing that uh, mm. so that this doesn't just become uh, another yet just leadership or HR agenda, but decisions are really reflecting the consequences of you do it or you don't do it. I think at its heart, a lot of this is bringing all of us together in a way that we really are all of us, but with very, very clear defined roles and responsibilities, big focus on what are we discussing right now and why have we got the right people and are we then conducting the discussion and making the decisions in the right way rather than 45 different subject matter experts downloading their piece and it not really being clear what was the decision? What have we got to make of all of that? So it's, I think it's the clarity and the structure, um, but also this but very, very behavioral uh, 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 approach and these, these habits have just, they've just made it simpler to take reasonably complex situations and bring them to the right point. And Jenny, I mean, you're, you're, you're much more the expert on this. I, 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 I use it and observe it. Uh, Jenny is very much part of the, uh, with Seb, part of the design of it, but it do, it's, it's working in practice. We are, we are having better meetings. We are making decisions more clearly, and we are seeing better accountability and, and, and better speed of um, um, a response and, and better ownership all the way to, the, mm. to, to completion. I think a lot of people leave meetings with lots of good intentions, a bit of confusion as to who's really doing what, but even when they know what they've got to do, maybe something else comes up and two weeks later, it's gone. So I think it's, it's really that own, taking ownership bit has been really important. The clarity and the structure has been important. And just consistency. Great, well, with that, James, Jenny, thank you so much for sharing uh, your story. It was riveting, fascinating, and also taking the questions. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um,